Welcome to today's presentation, five easy steps to kick off a Revit project. I'm your speaker today. My name is Drew Jarvis and I'm a technical consultant at SolidCAD based in Port Moody, BC. My background is mechanical engineering, but for the last 17 years, I've been assisting companies in the implementation of advanced workflows to help companies improve productivity and keep up with new technology trends. My work takes me all across Canada and primarily I work with architectural and engineering companies that are implementing Revit, Navisworks or BIM 360 based technologies. Getting started with a new project can be very quick or can take a very long time, depending on the standards defined within the company and the scope of the new project. Making sure you start with standards will avoid time-consuming rework at a later date. Through this presentation, I intend to outline the process I've used over countless projects to get up and running as quickly and effectively as possible. Decisions made now will help in the overall profitability of the project from a technology standpoint. Standards are required to assist team members in working across multiple projects concurrently. There are must-haves like project and view naming, and there are nice-to-haves like line styles and fill patterns. The more things you standardise, the more you can audit at a later date with processes like model health checking, and the less likely you are to have to rework data. Getting those standards into your project can either be done manually for every project, or you can use a template or starter project to predefine those standards that are going to be in the majority of your project files. I mentioned two methods of getting those repeatable standards into projects, both the template or the starter project. I prefer the starter project, which is a workshare enabled RVT file rather than a template RTE file, as it enables me to define work sets and use those for view control, as well as preset some elements on the correct work sets. Not communicating your standards and expectations to your end users is a common mistake once an effective standard has been produced. There are many reasons for this. Perhaps the person skilled at templates is not your best communicator, or perhaps you just don't have the time to have everyone sit and learn the standards. However, if you fail to educate everyone on the standards and where to implement them in a new project, then how are they going to perform the work to those requirements? Don't spend 100 hours on non billable time producing the standard and then forget to spend the five hours to tell people how to use them. Starting the project and creating views and sheets is the first step the end users will take. We will showcase this in the demonstration. We'll also show in a demonstration the import and link manager. This is a tool to repath multiple elements quickly. So let's switch over to Revit and take a look at some of these tools in the software. So here I have Revit 2022.1. You'll notice a ribbon tab at the top here for the CTC software. Below are different panels for the different suites I have installed. So I have my BIM Batch Suite, BIM Manager Suite, BIM Project Suite, as well as Hive. Within each of the suites, there are free tools and premium tools. So if you download and install the suite today, for 14 days, you'll get access to both the free tools and the premium tools. If you choose to purchase the software, you'll keep access to both. If you choose not to purchase, you'll still have access to the free tools. So well worth downloading and installing. Now to start our project, I'm going to use Hive. So I'm going to open up the Hive interface. Once Hive is open, it's simply a case of searching for the metadata or file names that you're interested in. So in my case, I'm looking for my starter project and I know I put the release value in each one of them. So I'm going to search for R22. And here is my starter project. I can simply just double click on it or right click and load. And the software will recognize that this is a project file that has work sharing enabled. So it's going to ask me the default is, do I want to detach from central with preserved work sets? And that's exactly what I'm looking for. It's going to give me a temporary file that I can save as my new central file for my project. So I'm going to click open. So I'm going to start up 
the tool called the view creator. So the view creator opens up and has a few tabs inside of it for different things that we're going to create. So right here I've got my initial levels. I want to make a few more levels and it's as simple as coming down and clicking add level here and then placing in the name and then placing in the elevation. Once I've got all those numbers in, I can hit create in order to change those. Now, this is also a place where we can modify the numbers. So if I got the wrong number in here and this is meant to be 5,500, I can simply change that. Once I close out of the tool and pan across, you can see where it's created those levels. If I select these levels now, I like to control my levels with a scope box. And so I'm going to come into here and pick the entire site scope box. But before I do that, I will need to make sure that scope box encompasses the entire project. So drag those down and up and then pick those. If it doesn't intercept in the scope box, then obviously it's not going to be able to use it. There we go. So now I've got all these levels, but you'll notice that I don't have any views yet. The annotation for it doesn't have the blue hyperlink on it. So in order to create the views, go back into the tools here, into the view creator, and I'm gonna take a look at the plan ceiling tools. Now, what it shows me are the levels in the project. It then shows me the view templates that I've created, and as well, it has the phasing. So I'm gonna pick all of my levels, I'm going to pick a couple of view templates. So I want the architecture, I want the furniture layout, I'm going to go with the communications and the um, dot work. I'm also going to say it's on the new construction phase. Now you'll notice that there's an abbreviation column filled in here. So this is to do with the naming. Down below, it's showing me it's going to name it with no prefix, the level name, the view template name, in this case, the abbreviation name, and then the phase. But for the phase, I've said no abbreviation because I don't want to see dash new construction on every single view. Now, that could be helpful if I do have multiple phases that I'm creating views for. But for this instance, I've turned that off. So right now, I've got 15 or so levels. I've got four different view templates. And so I'm going to be creating about 60 views. Before I click Create Views, though, I'm just going to hit Add. And down here, it's going to show me what they're called. So level one dash architectural level one dash comms, level one furniture, level one HVAC. Excellent. I'm going to hit create views. And you can see a little report at the end telling me it's created 52 views. Over in the project browser, we can then see the new views. So we've got our level one architecture through to the roof, similar for furniture, similar for electrical, mechanical, etc. Now, what if we needed dependent views? Well, right now, I don't really have anything set up for that, but what I'm gonna do is bring in my links. So if I do them manually, I've gotta go and click each one, say reload from, and then go and click the folder, even though it's gonna know exactly where it is, it'll require that I use that little dialog box to go and pick the file. Let's take a look at just using the import and link manager here, just to see the functionality of the batch processing. So this is a tool. I use this to find imports. It's a great way of finding those things that have been left behind inside your file and removing them. But I can also use it to do things like repathing. So right now, these are pointing to the, the wrong location. So I'm going to pick all of them. And I'm just going to go and reload them from a folder. And in this case, the folder here is here, the Revit links. Once I do that, it's going to reload all of those extras for me. So now as I close that one down and maybe open up one of the architectural floor pans, I can see that there is a bit of a building layout inside of here. This building layout though, it's too big for a singular view to fit onto my sheets. What I'm gonna need here are dependent views. Now dependent views is where it gets super manual and time consuming and uh, crushing to have to create, right? So you have to duplicate the view multiple times 
and then you need to rename each of one of them and then you go to the next view and you duplicate it as a dependent multiple times and you rename each of them horrible so back into the view creator here you'll see we have a dependent view now the dependent view is going to show us the, the views that have been made and the scope box is available that we can use for the boundary so let's go make a few more scope boxes on the view tab i've got my scope box tool i'm going to create one here and I'm going to call this building area A and I'm going to take that one copy it across that one's going to be building area B copy it down into a couple of locations here so I can take this one rotate it 32 move it into the spot And copy that down here. So a little bit of time. Get your scope boxes set up. Got building area A, B, C, D, E. Back into the tool. I'm going to go to my CTC software, premium tools, view creator, and click on the dependent views tab. And now you can see all those scope boxes available. So I could pick and choose a few of them, but hey, what the heck? Let's just make them all. So let's right click, check all. You can uncheck a few if you want, but I'm just going to go ahead and make them. So I made 52 views, was it? And now I've said I'm going to make five dependents for each one. 250 views. How long is that going to take you to do manually? It's going to take a few minutes, right? Let's click that button and allow it to make it for us. Okay, and because I didn't uncheck the entire site, I've now actually made too many dependent views, but we made 300 dependent views there in no time at all. Let's close that down and take a look. So we can see within the level one architecture, we've got our building A, building B, C, D, and E. Real time saver. Look at that beautiful naming. Everything's right. No manual mistakes. Fantastic. Back into that view creator. So those work set views are great for being able to track elements and make sure to run the right work sets. So this isn't something that's going to be created inside of your project. Uh, sorry, printed, I should say. It's just a view where you can go and keep an eye on things. So create those 3D views, right? So we have lots of different options up here. We can make our sheets here as well, but I'm going to show you another tool for that. Nothing wrong with the tool here. Just want to show you additional tools. In fact, let's go do that now. So I'm going to go over to the spreadsheet link. And what this spreadsheet link does is it creates Excel spreadsheets very similar, but different <laughs> to schedules. Now, a schedule, as you know, is not a spreadsheet. It looks like a spreadsheet. People make the assumption that it is kind of like a spreadsheet, but it's not. Elements in a schedule are indicated on rows inside of them. The parameters of those elements are indicated in by the columns. So it's not exactly the same as a, as a spreadsheet. But we can use very similar functionality here. Very comfortable to do that. Let's go scroll down first of all, pick a category. So I'm going to pick my sheets. And over here, we start to get the available parameters. So I'm going to bring in my sheet number, my sheet name, and also this custom parameter I created called sheet classification. Now, this is actually used for the organizing of the sheets inside of the project browser. So right now, I have one sheet. It's the starting view sheet, and you can see it populated here. I also now, though, have an Excel file that I'm going to show you that has all of the sheets I want to make. Let's take a look at that Excel file. So we can see here that I've got sheet number, sheet name, and sheet classification inside of Excel. And I've got 96 different sheets that I need to create. I'm going to go ahead and copy that. Then I'm going to go back into my CTC tool. And on the Create drop down here, there's actually a specific tool for this. There's a Create New Sheets. So I'm going to create 96 new sheets, selecting the title block and clicking create kind of adds in some placeholders 
with those placeholders, I can then go and paste in the values that I want for them. So I've got my sheet numbers, my sheet names, and my sheet classifications. So they're going to be organized into folders here for architectural, electrical, mechanical. Once I've got that, all I need to do is apply. Now this works whether it's making sheets or if it's editing rooms or spaces. So you could export out your room data, give it off to somebody else, have them fill in information about occupancy values or usage departments, whatever it is, and bring it back. Use this apply button here to apply back to the Revit model. We get a report at the end that indicates it has made 96 new sheets. Over in the project browser now, we can see the mechanical with the names and numbers as per the Excel sheet. So that brings an end to the presentation for today. I hope it's given you maybe a couple of ideas of uh, different things you can do when you set up your project, as well as showcasing some of the fantastic tools that come along with the CTC suites. Feel free to reach out to us. Here are our links that you can connect with us. Also, this is now the Q&A portion. So we'll take a look at any questions you have. And if you would like to pose any questions, please do 